Hello, my friends, and how are we doing? I hope everybody is doing well. Um, trying to deal with our internet and and the uh, connection of the software. I, I fired it up, and it it just kind of like uh, the screen was black, and then there were like lines going down it, like an like an old school error thing. So I don't know if you guys saw. Um, that or not and then the chat wouldn't load so i don't know if something's going on with youtube or with the streaming software but if you guys can hear me now then we should be good to go uh i hope so um all right what's going on mick aloha coro tom uh ada hello uh the one Eight six element John Monroe, what's up, buddy? Uh, also, uh, Gloss Galvin, hello. Uh, yeah, uh, just so folks know, generally when I set the time for a live stream, I'm usually gonna stream like five to ten minutes after whenever the time says, um, just because that's when the alert goes out, and then hopefully it sends out a second alert. I just do that because then hopefully more of, of my subscribers get alerts. People get, you know, obviously understandably frustrated when it, the YouTube just doesn't tell anybody. Um, but it looks like y'all at least heard the word and that the word was bird and you guys were in a birdie mood and wanted to come out. Uh, Jason, what's up? Logan, Johnny, House of Sass, what's up? Um, Ryan, Stan, uh, Evergreen, Neo Veritas, AG, um, who else is in here? Linda, hello. We got lots of good folks in here. All the good folks in here. Charles, welcome. Radio Flyer, welcome. Crack Tooth, welcome. Uh, Dionysus, uh, let's see here. Uh, Lara, hello. And Jurassic, <laughs> hello, um, uh, and Kimifer, that's an interesting name, hello, okay, uh, happy Friday, are you down in Australia, because it's Thursday here in America, uh, Tumblr Witch, Henry, hello, all right, so come on in, make yourselves at home. So today I kind of wanted to hear your guys' feedback about crabs. I mean, I have some things to say about crabs. I've cared for aquatic crabs. Um, but, ah, Friday Junior being Thursday. Got it. But yes, Jester, Friday down under. Crikey. Uh... Cave of Wonders, hello. So, crab. Let's get let's get a little. Um, oh yeah, thank you kindly, uh, Coro. And I really want to mention too uh, that you know, first of all, thank you mods for for helping uh, for helping uh, with modding and putting up links and stuff. I do appreciate that. Um, and thanks, like, Coro for, uh, posting. If you guys are looking for fish, shrimp, plants, crabs, um, for plants and shrimp, definitely check out Aquatic Arts, uh, if you don't have another place you want to shop, um, that's the place I recommend, and you can get a discount of 15% using my code, which is FISHTERY. 15 all caps and then the other code that we use is alex um over at dan's fish so if you want fish rare fish and, and unusual fish beautiful fish that are ethically sourced you know people i i know that i i've been pushing or or featuring them frequently but really it it makes my job easier and i find it cool to do a top 10 list of fish or something based off of fish that you could potentially go buy today 
it's kind of frustrating if I do a top 10 list that nobody's importing and they're like these really obscure fish that nobody can get their um, hands on, right? Uh, so, yeah. Sean, right on. Uh, you got your first aquatic arts purchase. Uh, got some Sakura cherry shrimp and Ember Tetras. Right on. Yeah. Um, and same with, uh, you know, the reason why I push those two in particular, but also I like redfish, bluefish, and I do like the wet spot for the selection and the access to imported stuff that nobody else may have. Moonlight Aquatics is another one that, you know, he's still young. He's a guy in his early 20s and he's starting a fish store. And I think that there's going to be some some issues with like quarantining and him not spotting all the diseases and things like that that will come up early on um, that are like currently an issue to the same extent that it is at most like local fish stores. Anyways, there's still some level of that. Dan's fish, he has an in-house actual ichthyologist slash, you know, veterinary medicine of fish uh, technician in-house now. And they're working like for the whole hobby, essentially, to identify some of these things that, that aren't even known yet about like, well, when fish come in and certain fish just don't do well, but they don't have an illness or a parasite that they can spot like let's do a test on you know let's culture their gut biome let's compare that to the wild uh gut biome of these ones that just came in from you know Colombia or wherever so pretty wild um and yeah if you want affordable uh shrimp uh while well, I was thinking about it um the uh the moonlight um aquatics gentleman young man he's a nice guy but he's got a really good price on imported shrimp for sure uh if you want u.s bread i mean then i think garden of eater which i've also got links to i don't get any kickback from him whatsoever he's just someone doing it the right way who i've gone and toured um, and that's what sets the bar for like who I'm going to shout out when I'm going to shout them out, why help a business. It's not that I'm getting a commission always like I only get a commission from two companies in the whole in all of this. OK, uh, and that is Dan's Fish, which I get a 2.5 uh, percent cut of the profit um, like in perpetuity whenever somebody's buying stuff. And then the uh, the aquatic arts, which generally they give me their my credits either in cash and we've donated it in the past or we will give it away on the channel here um, with gift cards and stuff around the holiday season and around July. Uh, that's kind of what we've done in years past for the most part um, or surprise if, if someone is in. Uh, being very, very kind and uh, compassionate. If someone's helping out, giving info in the uh, comments and like answering another person's question when they know they have a con uh, a fairly concrete answer uh, to help out, especially if it's like, oh, how do I treat this or how do I take care of that? When I see stuff like that, that's when I like to use up things like gift cards and stuff like that. So it allows me to do more of that and to, to maintain the community feel and and uh, activities like that that I feel are important to the channel. So that's why I keep um, pushing those. Um, so um, the other thing I was going to mention uh, before we get to crabs, there's a couple like big news stories. One is out of Colombia, Colombia, um, there is a total ban right now on collecting fish, which is, um, that's normal-ish. Uh, a lot of years, they have shut down 
fish collecting in the wet season, which is right now, uh, because fish in in uh, tropical, equatorial, jungle, rainforesty type settings, as a generality, they like to spawn as the water is either if it's if it's dry season, they'll spawn towards the end of it, and they'll allow the babies to be raised in these very uh, stagnant pools of water that they don't have much room but the parents can keep an eye on them and there aren't as many predators that's the first group and then by far the most common and bigger group is the ones that wait until the rains start and as soon as they detect that fresh water and that um the the tds drop because of uh it being dissolved or not dissolved uh the um the dilution so it's been diluted with rainwater uh, into the the water that they've been living in or even flow of it connecting to a creek or a river um or a, a lake overflowing its its boundaries and, and flowing out into somewhere else all those things you know trigger the fish to spawn because they want to have their babies and like in the case of Corydora uh corridoras uh they have their babies and within three days the eggs hatch and that's so that the fish can like get out and get going right away so that the um the current in the river the flow everything so it takes them away and they scatter everywhere there's no parental care they're not a cichlid or anything but then they'll hopefully populate these remote parts of the forest and so areas that are dry for three to seven eight months out of the year all of a sudden for some amount of time depending on where you go they're they're flooded like the whole the whole um if you look at the map it it would be blue you know most of the wet season whereas the, the dry season it's all green or forest and land uh, but there's any low spot in the landscape after the dry season it starts to evaporate off and drain out to sea you're going to have the low spots fill in and then you get lakes and marshes and swamps and some of them stay uh, uh, vibrant and full of life all year others dry right up but those new fish and fish in general want to get to all those places and so in the wet season it's more difficult to collect fish but there are more babies being collected there's more fish spawning and when fish are spawning one a lot of times they're easier to catch they're not concerned with the the same things as the rest of the year they're not as on uh, guard or defensive against predators or fishing nets stuff like that uh so that's part of the reason why they they say like let's have a happy little uh recess for a couple months we won't collect anything and then we'll go back to collecting and you know hopefully everything will will be good to go um uh miss hippy fit hello and uh let's see here uh Uh, not all quarries will hatch in three days, but most eggs from quarries will hatch within 72 hours. Yeah. Um, Hawkeye, what's going on? Um, you're having trouble finding auto sinkless. You know, I have also um, not seen them as much lately because the other day I wanted to get some just uh, to, to toss in a couple different tanks just to kind of have working on the. The, that algae the powdery stuff on the glass the diatom algae uh but you know they're caught in the wild generally from the wild because it's so much cheaper than breeding them in captivity and so yeah i'm i'm guessing that part of the reason is what i'm about to talk about which is columbia is not um is not uh exporting the fish now the whole not exporting thing has kind of been a mixed bag in that 
sometimes they when when they say that the, the, the exports shut down that means for any fish that was so any fish caught in the in the time period when things are shut down those cannot be exported however any fish that are sent out caught outside of that so if they were caught six months ago and they've been in holding tanks that's totally fine to ship those out the problem is the ones that are uh, freshly caught they don't want to incentivize anybody to be doing collecting even though you know there's a break on exports that that necessarily wouldn't mean that the, it would stop people from collecting fish and in fact some places take that as a, a time of the year to kind of stock up on what ever fish they want to have a lot of on hand uh, or it happens to be a time when fish are spawning and you can do something like go find a log and pick up the log and all of a sudden you've got freshly hatched autosynclus or quarries or something and you've got you know a thousand babies that you can shake out of one log into a just like rubbermaid container or a basket or whatever and they'll do that and then they'll they'll grow them out in a pond or whatever so that that was happening though it was people were selling still through this kind of um time out period and so i was trying to figure out why uh all the price guides and lists this year look different in that like you weren't seeing any of like certain apistos certain um earth eaters pencil fish um and a number of tetras and plecos that normally we see uh, consistently throughout the year. It, it, this last round of lists were it was it was noticeable. Some of the stuff that normally is easy to get your hands on is affordable was not there, or it was really high priced, or it said sourced in Asia or sourced you know somewhere else. Um, if it's a trans shipper or something, where they have multiple sources, but then uh, i got a hold of the um the agricultural and um let's let me look at the email real quick it is uh i couldn't figure out what was going on a lot of people had messaged me and said well you know what is going on in colombia like i'm trying to order fish for my store and I can't figure out what's going on. Can you help me? You know, can you help me, Alex? Can you figure out what's different this year? The rumor is that that they are mad at poachers, and because of that, they've shut down the whole hobby or the whole uh, exporting uh, sector from uh, Colombia. Well, anyways, I called uh, them. No answer or anything. Uh, overseas call but i was able to get an email from their uh, commissioner of uh commerce that's what it is uh, agriculture and commerce and that that office i'm sure it wasn't the actual person that is the head but uh it it's signed like it is it said like this year we are uh basically we're tired of past years when we put this moratorium or uh, quota on what people can collect in the wet season in order to try and preserve the baby uh, nests and clutches from being decimated also just the fact that it's a food web and a lot of fish have a lot of babies that are gonna 90 percent of them become food to something else in the in the river or to even to other fish in the river uh, and that's everything from like one millimeter tiny teeny little larval fish all the way up to your you know larger you know uh cichlids that do take care of their young and release them from care at an inch or two long you know some of the bigger fish um so they're having issues with that before you know because brazil doesn't allow exports really um of any of the ornamental fish wild caught ones uh lately um 
they opened that up in 2021, uh, legally speaking. Like, they put it back on the books in Brazil that you could uh, export. It's just they didn't allow it. Um, when it comes time of the year to come up with the quotas, they didn't they didn't uh, give any out to different companies on what they could export. Um, so they haven't allowed a whole lot. But, but in the last couple of years, now we have seen some stuff trickling out of Brazil again. But it serves as a reminder to, you know, Colombia, which is right next door. It serves as a reminder to to the exporters and the wholesalers and the collectors that like we can turn this tap off like if, we, if they have a problem with you know you're over taxing this resource um, or one of the fish that is um, you know being most uh, exported is in harm's way or is it all threatened or endangered on the IUCN red list or something that's when you know they need it to be taken seriously. And so far, people are totally ignoring that. People are just catching whatever they can catch. And, you know, you've got your piabaeros, which they are, they're good. They know what they're looking for. They know, you know, they, they've grown up several generations at least um, trying to catch the ornamental fish. Now, they also try to catch food fish, and that's kind of traditionally the the big priority um so now i mean why not if you're already out there catch any fish you can catch catch the big ones catch the little ones and um bring them all to market and sell the little ones as your pet fish uh trade and the big ones as uh, your food fish and generally they will try to get stuff that is seen as food fish because if it gives them a lot more money uh, that day on the spot in the ground uh, in the, in the ground in the rainforest um people you know people got everywhere got to eat uh and that that's a better deal for them a lot of times than if they were to um sell it to a middleman or a wholesaler or a trans shipper and then like wait to get paid on on either a commission or uh and that would be the most they could get paid i suppose would be waiting to see how many they sold and then like kind of keeping track for them most places just buy up say you know what do you have you have a thousand rummy nose tetras okay well we'll buy all those here's five us dollars and i'm not joking that that's a pretty like accurate uh amount what they pay the indigenous people um you know a day's work like maybe four to eight bucks or something you know uh but in any case so i talked to the colombian uh, agriculture and uh, uh, trade not sorry not trade commerce uh an agricultural uh, minister, minis, minis, ministry, uh, like the band, and they uh, said that yeah, we want we wanted to send the message this year uh, that we're not we're not playing around. You guys need to not stop sending out fish either like packed in with you know edible fish or whatever. Like the people are smuggling out fish to some degree or they're mislabeling it as something else like live um tilapia or something like that uh and now they're they're saying that like well if you can't be collecting them why why should you be selling them in that same period so i kind of understand where they're coming from it's a it's a little frustrating because my heart my mind kind of are of the opinion that like fix Fix the fisheries and fish runs and things that you know are troubled and need help or don't allow fishing and what what not there. But if, if if there's enough of the fish, if they're healthy, the population's stable, all that, then like go ahead and export, um, you know, catch, catch them. You're never going to catch even a fraction of how many, especially of like nano fish type fish like neon tetras or something there are in, in even that little region um 
so that's that's kind of my opinion but i wanted to let you guys know why you might want to if there's anything you're looking at that's from central or northern south america which i know sounds confusing um like central central south america not central america but central south america right around the brazilian border up to colombia panama up to the you know the the connecting point of central america into um venezuela on one side and then on the other you know where colombia is on the pacific and uh you know ecuador and all that below but all those areas right now don't be playing you know like i hope it goes well i hope that they that it one that it's actually helping conservation because i couldn't find any detailed studies that actually revealed whether or not it was helpful right whether or not it 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 had an, any impact at all on the, on the populations. Um, all right. Uh, doesn't that just create more of a black market? Yeah, it could, Mike. It could. Um, yeah, all that hard work just to get $5 for those fish. Yeah. Um, it was three years ago. There was a guy who went down into deep into the Amazon, like way deeper than uh western journalists and things generally go it was i think man i want to say it was like it took them over two weeks to get there because they have to get on a boat that goes up the river every like like once a month or once every couple weeks and it stops at every little village and then they spend the night on the boat and then they have to get on another boat and then that goes somewhere and then they have to wait a few days to get another boat to somewhere um and it's because too like you could take a helicopter in theory if you had a bunch of money but you got to refuel and so where are you going to refuel in the middle of the amazon uh so anyways they get these uh they they get they get way way out there sometimes and and on on these trips um and when they are out that far the amount of money that they pay, even when they've got like a generator and a big old boat, you know, waiting on the river on the main channel of, you know, the, say, I don't know, the Rio Negro or something. Uh, they'll have the boat with generators and air pumps and uh, pumping fresh water and all that stuff to take care of the fish, um, AC even sometimes. But what's interesting, too, is a lot of times the AC is um not for humans at all it's just so that the boat doesn't get you know overheated but um yeah so they'll get those things back but in the documentary they showed them uh with a bag that looked like a, a trash bag kind of thing or even even more bizarre like a um like kind of like a safeway or a grocery bag that's not even you know you wouldn't even think of it for for fish that they uh, have uh, just filled with neon uh, blue tetras. Uh, and they'll have that bag with almost no water in it, like just barely enough water that, okay, there's some water in the bag, maybe 20% of the bag is water and the rest is literally fish, just like crammed in there for the moment. And then they'll hand over the bag and they'll weigh it uh dry which is just like basically when they put a bunch of fish through uh like a colander or a strainer or a net plop them into the bag weigh the sack of fish and then they give them money based on that in in, in metric and it was a, a kilogram was like four dollars and 29 cents is what they were paying for the neon tetras and silver tip tetras the black phantom tetras uh, like a number of the the more common tetras, the black neon tetra, um, the green neon tetra, uh, those that come and are still so affordable. I mean, if you think about it, a lot of these fish are going from they're going from uh, where they live in the wild to whoever's collecting them to a middle person who's going to get them out of the deep recesses of the amazon or the uh okavanga delta or wherever they are in the world 
And then they get to uh, usually a, a international broker or wholesaler or, or a supply company that will have them change out the water generally. Sometimes they'll have holding tanks and sometimes they'll have like actual ponds and a like kind of farm set up so that it's like they can grow the fish out or um, get them to grow bigger um, before they sell them or just to hold them so that they can sell them throughout the year, that sort of thing, um, or false scarcity, so to speak. And from there, that's that's what, two or three stops, and like the stress on the fish is really high. And same with uh, if they're medicating in between, it can, it can be very, very high too. Um, and that first person is going to, you know, they're going to get that that bag of fish and generally that size of a bag of fish is going to have like 1350 to 1600 uh fish in it and you're thinking that's four dollars and 29 cents or whatever you know it's probably changes you know anywhere from three to five bucks or something but that much i mean we're talking like half a penny of fish or or a point two pen like five fish for a, a penny and one that that's i mean that's that's wild and it also causes it to be that it's not in the forefront of everyone's mind the, the conservation the preservation and the ethics of caring for them so that's another thing that why i like certain suppliers is they work with certain people they get their fish certain places, um, you know, or that have instructed uh, various locals of, of, you know, the way the way to do it ethically so that they don't die along the way. Sorry, guys, stand in because my, my back gets sore and uh, my eyes get, get uh, tired looking at the trying to read the screen and look up at the the, the chat uh, or the webcam. Um, but then they get out of the country and either they go to a local store or you know breeder or something who's really really intensely into you know the hobby if they're importing their own stuff uh or you know m the most common cases it goes to the wholesaler uh, that exports it to the u.s then in the u.s there's a trans shipper as they're called either in new york or la or san francisco or Miami, and they will change the water. They will put medications in sometimes. Uh, sometimes they'll feed them for like a day or two and put them in a, their own little like tank with um, by, by species. But oftentimes what they'll do is they'll combine an order. And so they'll all sit in the same water uh, or share the same pump system because there's just isn't enough room to, to bring in like dozens of different customers orders of each having dozens of different fish and a lot of times they're the same they overlap so so they'll just take you know smaller containers little boxes clear boxes or mesh um containers little nets and they'll set them up uh while they are coming in and then they they uh, set those up to go out to the local fish stores to go out to people like dan's fish or jason or uh at redfish bluefish or aquarium co-op like then those places sometimes even actually are a regional hub for for the the hobby so if you're in somewhere like um oh i don't know uh, let's try to think of somewhere uh the navajo reservation you know in the southern u.s you may have somebody that is is the wholesaler uh nearby and they're going to have fish on demand ready for anybody who wants to drive there but that could be people from utah and you know uh as far away as a couple states away in some rare cases probably but that's when you've got two tiers of the importers rather than just the one if 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 you got ma and pa stores they can't afford to um to, to sit on large amounts of stock i guess anyways 
what's going on with chat y'all are kind of quiet um yeah actually uh laura i think there might be uh let's take a look real quick uh and also let's let's just let's take a stretch Oh, crack crack your back if you got one. And by the way, uh, Dan's fish is going to be on, I think, in like 20 minutes. So if uh, you do want to watch his stream, I won't be offended, but tell him I, I say hello. Say Alex says hi. Uh, sorry, Alex, I should be chatting, but you got me shopping for fish collecting supplies. <laughs> yeah, it's all good. Um, what is the best type of totally aquatic crabs? Yeah, let's talk crabs. Um, the other thing I was going to update you on, other than the whole Columbia uh, drama, um, is that basically, okay, so Columbia said, you know, basically, if it doesn't change with the poaching and the black market, we're going to shut you guys down for like half the year and or like a whole year or two years. And we'll see how you like that, which won't help the black marketing issue at all. But that's just kind of the, I don't know, the way it goes. It's just like, you know, drug policy or something like that. Like it doesn't always make sense, uh, the economics of it or the incentives of it. It's more the optics of it, you know. Uh, they they draw a line and say no like there's not going to be any importing or exporting of these poor fish because they're vulnerable when really it's like oh it's because they've been skirting government regulations going out through peru to Iquitos, and instead of going out through customs in uh colombia they try to get them out through a, a cheaper route in peru uh so my cat Sorry, Gary, uh, the kitty is gone. The kitty is, uh, well, they found, uh, they found, a uh, um, a cat on the, on the road, uh, months, like a month and a half ago or so. It was, it was, so I, I found this out relatively recently but it sounds like it sounds like her description um and the neighbors that found her uh, buried her but i'm not going to be like dig it up cuz it's been you know up over a month um but yeah they they saw a little black long-haired cat that got hit by a car um or had been hurt badly by coyotes it was basically just all bloodied and on the side of the street um so i think that was the cat that i think that was silky unfortunately um, and yeah obviously she hasn't been back um okay all right um but uh where was I going to go after that? Sorry, guys. We, we're going to touch on crabs, but... Um... Oh, right. The other big news. So, they just recently rediscovered the Javan tiger. The tiger that lives on the island of Java. It was thought to be extinct since 1978. And they just got DNA that was on a, a, I think it was a, like a, a wire fence with, with, um, like, uh, barbed wires or some sort of burrs on it to, to stop cattle and things from, um, moving over the fence or, or pushing the fence. Uh, and, uh, they, they found, yeah, that, that the hair they had found on these, uh, regional fence posts and um why can't i think of the name of the little the barbed wire like curly q with the little points the actual um piece of it the lock maybe it's called a lock i, I don't know 
anyways, on that little thing, there there was like a auburn or reddish color hair uh, on a few of them, like a real, um, you know, organic, like ochre kind of color, orangey red. And um, it turns out that it, it was the Java, the Java um, tiger. And we thought it was extinct since 1978. There have been some reports of seeing it. Uh, one was pretty credible by a, a veterinarian and biologist um, in 2018. I think it was 2000. Maybe actually no, 2015 was the last solid, like, believable case. And then also Forrest Galante, um, who has had uh, all sorts of shows on nature, um, like on Animal Planet or Discovery or whatever, also on YouTube. Uh, he has a podcast as well. Um, he went to go look for it in some um, kind of cheesy show called i think it was called like um cryptic zoology or looking for cryptids or you know something like that but the it, they look for stuff that's supposed to be extinct or that's supernatural or that's you know some mythical creatures or it's an episode where they go over true stories of you know endangered species that have gone extinct and maybe they're out there like the thylacine the tasmanian devil that's the other one that he thinks is still out there. But the fact that they now know for sure that in 2019, the all the the fur is specifically that of a Jav, Javanese tiger. Um, they compared it with some pelts that were in the archives, uh, both in Europe and in um, Jakarta, I believe it was they compared the 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 um fur and looked at it under a microscope and then genetically too and and determined that yes in fact this was the javanese um, tiger not a, another tiger which is really cool and um then the other thing is they just discovered the biggest biggest snake species in the world so the anaconda is obviously a monster snake as it is. It's a, a big snake. You know, they get 20 feet long and uh, can eat deer and small people. Uh, they stick to deer generally. <laughs> uh, and that's if they're lucky. But they went in, and by they, I mean a group of scientists went in in uh, Brazil, and they went into the, who, I think it was the War, Warungi people, and they said, you know, we have a, uh, essentially a god. We have a, a spirit or a, a deity that is a snake. Like, he lives in this mountain or, I don't know, whatever, hill, and this river. And so they went to the kind of uh, raised uplands, so like a plateau kind of thing, and in this reservation within a kind of um, encircled mountain range kind of deal. And they, what they found was a new species of, uh, I guess, I, I think they, they're classifying it as uh, yellow anaconda, but this one was 26 feet long. The one that they found was 26.5 feet long. Um, you know, in metric, we're talking 10 meet. Or wait, that's not right. We're talking, um, we're talking, uh, what would that be? Uh, if it's just short of that. So 30, um, why can't I do this in my head? nine plus nine or three plus three plus three that's nine that's three meters uh and that would be um is somebody gonna help me with this <laughs> why can't i do this in my head right now you guys uh let's see here uh three meters 
or one meter is three feet ish and the, this thing is say 27 you know just to round it or whatever feet long so it, it's how many meters uh three three six uh nine nine meters i guess um so yeah pretty crazy and the people there said that that wasn't even a quote-unquote big one or the uh like the mother snake which to them is like this folklore thing but but now they're saying that there's a snake out there somewhere that uh the locals are claiming is like 50 feet long you know um so we'll see uh it, it was uh just totally uh ignored by the outside world until recently until somebody said you know what like there are some big anacondas out that way let's check that area out anyhow and wouldn't you know it there's a giant yellow anaconda uh that exists and the yellow anaconda is also i think they said it was 18 percent different than the green anaconda and then like nine percent different than the other uh yellow anacondas in the area but all of this point being is that on an island and then in a native uh people's preserve uh park type set situation where people have been before but it's very remote um suddenly they're discovering not little animals but massive animals and um yeah they found it in brazil um and uh you know it's also it was a species that they had run into before but it was like misclassified or they didn't know if it was two separate species or whatever so it's not like they it's completely new to science but it is the the size the fact that they get that big and that they got one and found it with the help of the locals quickly like that that's impressive because the the locals want them to come in and basically do something to help because illegal gold mining uh deforestation uh the palm oil plantations the burning of the the forest and stuff all of that is uh expediting the loss of of where these these snakes live but i'm just saying uh who knows uh who knows what fish are out there right I mean, fish are really hard to find compared to a 30 foot long snake that basks in the sun. Uh, okay. So let's pull up this real quick. Um, do 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 I have been talking with Aquatic Arts, and Aquatic Arts, um, it, yeah, anacondas are the longest snake, whereas reticulated pythons, I mean, they're close, but they, they're also bigger, heavier snakes. Um, and hello, wife. My wife's home. So say hello to wife, everybody. Wait, reticulated pythons are longer in length, but green anacondas are much heavier and nearly as long. Are you sure? I thought it was the other way around. It, okay, I'm not going to speak on it. I'm not a snake expert. Uh, I thought it was the other way around, though. I thought pythons got bigger. But I, what do I know? I'm not a snake man. I'm not Alex the snake man. I'm Alex the fish man. Amisa, what's up? Um. Okay, so I've been working with Aquatic Arts. They've been importing lots of different things um, in the crab world. 
Now, they've been bringing in a whole lot of crayfish for a long time. So, that's the first thing. Uh, let's see here. So, that's the first thing that I wanted to mention is that, you know, they kind of wanted me to, to get into keeping some of these so I could show off, you know, for their company, essentially. So, that's what I'm talking about, like, benefits of working with them. Is like, I might not get paid um, for talking about, like, this right now. But, like, when when you guys use the affiliate link or they send me free stuff to try out... Like, that's definitely something that I'm benefiting from. But check this out. They've got, right now, um, they've got a sale going. You don't even need a code or anything. It's only $13.99 for these uh, Mexican dwarf crayfish. Uh, but there's all these other crayfish, too, uh, that are in the hobby and beautiful um, They come and go, though, what's in stock, like pretty frequently um so that's kind of where things started and now they're getting into crabs and they're getting into breeding uh crabs at their come on now at their own um facilities and some i is Sorry, guys, this thing, this, uh, it's supposed to be sharing, like, each click with you, um, but it's, it's being difficult. Let's go with um, semi-aquatic freshwater crab. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So, these are ones they're breeding in-house. Um they bought them obviously <laughs> from um, from Borneo and Malaysia and uh, India, but these are the vampire crabs, the the um, Geosotharma, uh, and they come in. I think there's like 130 species, in them, like no joke. Um, some of them are so, you know fascinating with the patterns on the backs and stuff the other thing that's really uh funny or charming about these guys is like these ones like the apricot ones i've um played with those and when they see that you're in the fish room they, they can turn their little independent eyeball antenna or whatever you want to call the eyeball uh joint or socket in their head they can turn it all the way, like this guy here has his eye, his pupil, all the way backwards. So they can turn and watch you with just their eye. So their eye just stays in one place. Make sure you're not doing anything to threaten them or come near them. Um, I just think that's kind of cool. But like, look at all of the beautiful color forms these come in. Not to mention, they also do a pretty uh, great, pretty great job uh, bringing in new and interesting stuff there um, that that nobody else has. They've got a couple suppliers that are are pretty cool, um, definitely. So even though some of this stuff, uh, probably not these crabs in particular, I wouldn't assume. Uh, even though they're these ones aren't on sale. The ones that are, um, from time to time, it's always interesting. Uh, they're sold out of some of them. Yeah, but these are all in stock right now. So they've got this carnival vampire, uh, this rainbow crab, uh, this red apple, which I think that's the one sushi my neighbor has. And then there is the orchid vampire crab, which is really uh, small and and uh, even more even more petite and gentle. Uh, but 
they keep finding more species and some of these live like up in the trees and they'll come down to the water to reproduce or to molt or vice versa they'll go up into a tree molt hide for a few days and then once everything's cool they'll they'll come back down um they're really an interesting critter um let's see here uh, Okay, uh, and you know, these ones are semi-terrestrial. So these ones, you want like a paludarium setup. So while they can be underwater for like hours, um, they, they, they do need to come up and get sips of air, uh, these ones in particular. Now, there are true freshwater crabs. And there's a lot of these species as well. Like, um, it's just, they're, they tend to be smaller and a little less colorful. And so I think people just don't talk about um, some of the variety that you could have in the aquarium. But these guys have, have been well talked about now. Right, like the pom poms and the, uh, little cry uh micro crabs these guys are so tiny um i don't even know like how to deal with these little <laughs> these little guys but these ones like the panther crab i think that one actually could can live underwater fully uh i know that um chang at moonlight aquatics he's kept his underwater fully for at least a couple months now, I don't know if they come to the top of like a sponge filter or a rock and maybe they're like taking a sip of air or they just float themselves somehow or, you know, scoot themselves along. But these three are really the, the, the big options um, at the exact moment. But then there's also uh, the White Claw uh, Tauti, Tauti, um crab. And this looks very much like the others uh, that we were just looking at, the like little candy crabs and things. But this one, let's see, does it actually say, I was going to say, I think it's from, oh, I won't say it. Let's see. I just think, do, do, do. they require stable aquatic parameter environmental. Um, so woody crabs are relatively well managed in terms of care. Minimum tank size, 20 gallons. Um, omnivorous. But these guys will breed in captivity for you. So if you had, oh, I know that I was going to try to show you guys if they're on here yet. Um, Oh, well, no, maybe they won't be in that. So they're going to start selling. Um, oh, right here. Good. They're up. Springtails and isopods. So they're going to start a collection of these. They're already breeding several others that aren't, you know, for sale yet. But, I mean, if you need to inoculate your pal paludarium or terrarium, these are rad and they've got um a few kinds they're they're hoping to get more um if if you happen to raise uh you know some really funky cool looking ones definitely let them know um uh, you know there's all sorts of little color morphs now uh between these and the these basically pill bugs for under underwater uh underwater um what do they call that porcelionoides pro proenos i mean that i'm not even gonna try uh, <laughs> but yeah, so they have like different colors, um, white tropical springtails, lilac colored springtails, 
And then here you got, this is a better example. Um, how much they look like little potato bugs or pill bugs, same, same exact grouping, except these are aquatic. And they want to be, like, like at aquatic arts, they want to be pushing people into keeping paludarium so that they can also keep some immersed plants. Uh, but I'm trying to decide, like, out of all these crabs and and crayfish and all that kind of stuff, is it worth it? Do I want to do any of that? Or am I over it? Like, it, it's too much work to take care of these crabs and have a paludarium where the humidity has to be like 80%. If it's not, they can't molt. And if they get stuck in their molt, they die. Um, what do you guys think? Do you guys want to see me try to take, take care of these crabs? I personally would rather have dark frogs, but I'm getting, I'm getting the pressure from, from aquatic arts, but also just from people asking so many darn questions about, uh, these crabs and I've never kept them really. Um, so, I mean, I've kept panther crabs and the Thai micro crabs, the, the truly aquatic ones but i haven't kept the uh the the um the vampire crabs and stuff like that so much i mean they're they're fairly easy to breed from all i understand Ooh, pac-man frogs yeah i do i mean i love that kind of stuff my wife not so much she does not love the the uh snakes and springtails and tarantulas and scorpions i i don't like actually i don't really like millipedes scorpions or tarantulas uh much either but uh i'm not like freaked out can't eat my lunch or anything but i'm just kind of like eh, yeah i don't know if i want that to get out in the house and crawl up my pant leg while i'm making a grilled cheese sandwich at three in the morning um uh coral you're hilarious dart frogs take up a smaller footprint uh than vampire crabs from what i understand i could see where that would really be true um there i think yeah i mean it makes sense because you you you've got all that room to go up in the canopy uh other than reproducing in like a vermiliad or a certain you know in the plant that's the right time of year blah 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 um it's nice to have uh, maybe some seasons that, where stuff does change it's nice to have uh a different way to see plants grow and then also just to have that like water column uh along with the land kind of gives a yin yang like a balance to certain tanks so i could see digging it um but yeah have you seen Howie the Crab? I have not. Are jumping spiders dangerous? Not to my knowledge. Um, most spiders are not dangerous. Um, they just, yeah, they just don't happen to be super dangerous other than, um, I mean, like brown, brown recluse, um, I think, is it the emperor? Emperor, emperor scorpion around here and then there's the um, obviously the brown recluse and the black widows are the two spiders that you need to worry about in north america essentially but we you know we don't see much of that here in my state which i'm okay with um but yeah, I mean, what do you guys think? Do you think we should go ahead and try it out and uh, do what my my masters ask of me? No, I'm just kidding. Uh, you know, they want me to try out these crabs that they've been breeding, and they want me to try breeding them and see how it goes, see if really a first-time owner uh, of, of those kinds of crabs could figure out, you know, what crab lives well with, with other animals. Because the other thing is, like, some other crabs, like those panther crabs, they're just downright mean. Even though they work in the water, they they will grab any anything that their pincher can grab. They will grab and like 
basically swim off with it to try to hide and eat it somewhere on their own. They're such little, such little rascals. Uh, so yeah, what size, what size setup uh, are they recommending? Uh, I think like only maybe three and a half or five gallons, I think. Let's see, let's see what size they're recommending. Which honestly, like, I know that that's not hardly anything for, for most folks in their mind, but it should be enough for them. Let's see. Uh, <clears throat> okay. Trying to find if they have. That's weird. Um, it does. I'm not. Oh, here we go. Five gallons for a male and two females. Uh, larger colonies require larger tanks. Uh, Thanks. So yeah, I mean, it sounds like you get up one and it's like a three gallon, no problem. But what fun is that? So maybe a male and two females, like they're saying, in a five a five gallon tank would be fine. Um, the little pom pom crabs, Thai micro crabs, you can have a fifty of them in a tank. They're tiny. Might might as well count those as shrimp. But. Crabs can be a little messy. They also shed. You know, there's also the potential of mold in their enclosure and stuff like that. Um, but if you guys think it's something you'd like to see me do, like to see me learn and share my learning experience with you guys, then I'll do that for the channel. But otherwise, maybe I'll just go interview someone else who's doing that. But, you know, they, they there is quite a bit of interest in these crabs and in things like crayfish and i've kept crayfish in the past as well but they get to um i don't know they get to yeah i don't know okay guys that's all i've got for you tonight um get a plastic pool for them oh yeah Oh, I remember what I was gonna say. They they get um they get co uh complacent or adjusted, I guess is probably a better word, uh, to whatever you have set up. And I want like an, a crab to be doing forward. Well, pop pop mic is not working. Let's take a step back. I want um I want the um I want a crab to be doing cleanup work or uh you know be a part of the like detritus cleanup team something like that like i don't want to just have to feed the crabs themselves necessarily um uh, but i also don't want them eating like all my fish um so there's kind of a catch-22 and even though those those crabs aren't like super vicious or anything it is something where like yeah they do kind of make a mess and yeah you do need to keep the uh, humidity up and things like that. Uh, so do I do it? Do I not? My, uh, my eyes are getting very, uh, getting very uh, tired and uh, dry. So I'm lucky right now that I am already home. No driving needs to be done or anything. Um, but I am going to call it an evening right, right about quick here. Uh, I am working on right now three new video ideas uh so they'll probably all show up um tomorrow maybe one depending on what happens uh with my schedule uh for editing uh, and then like maybe every day or two after that we'll we'll also 
All right, guys. Well, I am getting, uh, I'm getting, uh, oh, thanks. Thanks, Sissy. You, you like the videos lately? I've been trying to add a lot more B-roll and things like that. The thing is that the B-roll software, they want $1,500 a month to use their video clips uh, unlimited. Uh, and if you don't do unlimited, it's like you get, I think you get like 60 images or something for $79 or something. I, don't, I can't remember exactly what it, it's different on each different site, but I want to be able to use stock footage for you guys. So you guys can see like into, uh, you know, if we do a species profile video now, I'd like to include footage of the actual, uh, habitat and stuff. Uh, so. If anybody knows of a good service or, um, you know, a way to save money that works well for getting that, that B-roll, <laughs> uh, let me know. All right, guys. Well, I'm going to let you go. Uh, I'm never going to give you up. Never going to let you uh, desert me. Desert me. That, that's what the song says. Desert me. All right, guys. So <laughs> if you're still interested in talking about fish, talking about aquatic life and luxuries, go on over to Dan's Fish. I'll probably be there. Uh, I do film my own B-roll. Um, it's hard to find B-roll of, uh, you know, Amazonian tribes people guiding people to an anaconda. Uh, or uh, an aerial shot of a uh, river valley in Yunnan province, China. Uh, these are all things that like, yeah, I'd love to put them in the video so folks can see it. So it's interesting, um, but I'm never going to be able to pay for flying all those places, collecting all that stuff and keeping track of all that. Like, so that's why these uh, services exist. Um, yeah, 1500 is nuts, isn't it? Like, uh, it's like, I'm, I'm not even going to make that much on the YouTube. So, like, after taxes and everything, it'd be like, okay, there goes every penny you make on YouTube after seven years of doing this, multiple videos every week for seven plus years. And now you're back to zero. So, I just can't afford it right now. Um, but I do hope to someday soon, if, uh, if I ever have. A nice video go viral. Maybe that'll kick it up a notch where I can get that. But all right, guys, I'm going to get out of here. Uh, if you want, go over to Dan's Fish and uh, he'll be there. I'm sure lots of great fish keepers will be. He always does giveaways. I think tonight is uh, ivory mystery snails or something like that. Um, but uh, that's it. Much love. I'll talk to you later. I'm fading now and uh, I hope you all have a wonderful. I want to go ahead. Bye, guys.